Your attention tonight, this is a very, very special presentation, and um, it sort of got more and more special as we put it together. <laughs> it started off, uh, it always starts off, I like to interview the performers and, you know, talk with, about them, about the music, and then um, we have this wonderful exhibit going on, um, Sound Moves, which is all about music and chess. And Bradley Bailey, who we have here, is a professor at SLU and one of the, and the curator for the exhibit here at the World Chess Hall of Fame, Sound Moves. So I thought it'd be perfect to have him come and speak with us a little bit about Prokofiev Oistrakh, talk a little bit about this music and the history of and relationship of chess. And then we thought, who better to bring on to talk about chess than one of our own, Grandmaster Yasa Sarawan, who is, um, you know, Grandmaster, you know, a man about town. Uh, <laughs> man, he, uh, I always say you're, the, you're sort of one of our anchors for what I call a chess PN, chess ESPN, that we have on here at the Royal Chess Hall of Fame. And um, we're so looking forward to hearing from Yasser about some of the specifics of these chess matches. So um, without further ado, yes? Four time US champion. Four time US champion, everyone. Just a man on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I got dragged in. There you go. We appreciate you being here. Bradley, do you want to take it away and talk a little bit about some of the, the music we're going to hear tonight? And maybe we can chat a little bit about um, sort of your perspective, and then I can maybe chime in every now and then about I some of the music. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of want to hear Brian's thoughts about you know, not just chess and music, but about what we're going to be hearing uh, tonight. And I just brought some images just because I'm an art historian, and when I present, I just find it more interesting to have something to look at than uh, someone just talking. And uh, a piece that Oistrakh really kind of specialized in, one of the uh, pieces that's a, a real, you know, sort of traditional showpiece is uh, Tartini's Devil, Devil's Trill. And I wanted to ask Brian what he thinks is so special about the Devil's Trill, and then we can maybe go a little bit into the story. The story behind it? Yeah. Well, uh, it's not only, well, it's fiendishly difficult, how about that, <laughs> for, the, for the violinist. Um, there's certainly a lot of fireworks to be heard. Um, Hannah G., who I am collaborating with tonight, is the assistant concertmaster at the St. Louis Symphony, and um, this is a, a staple of her repertoire. She performs this piece a lot. Um, it's our first time playing it together. But uh, yeah, it's, it's got that sort of, uh, the difficulty I think is the first thing that comes to mind. And the version we're playing is a version by Fritz Kreisler, who is a, another famous um, historical violinist. And he sort of cranks it up to 11 in terms of just how much you're gonna hear virtuosity from the violinist. Um, I'm really just bumping along in this one. It's really, this is her big, you know, Jimi Hendrix moment she has here <laughs> to, to show us what she's got. But um, in that sense, yes, but I think the, 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 the devil's also in the, in the sound of it. Because a trill, for those who are unfamiliar, is sort of an alternating between, between two notes, and it has this kind of unsettled sound to it. So it's, very, it's a bit of a novelty piece in that it's not violin playing like we're always used to. It, there's this constant sort of shaking and shuddering from the violin part that um, is, is new for many of us. So there's an excitement there as well. So the story is that Tartini has a dream, and in this dream he makes a pact with the devil, and the devil takes his violin and plays this piece that is the greatest thing that Tartini's ever heard, and upon waking he tries to recreate it, he tries to write it down, but he's just incapable, incapable of doing it, and to him that's kind of what makes the piece so special is that you can't achieve what the devil can do. And so, uh, this is a, a very, very famous print that shows up on the cover of pretty much every copy of the Devil's Trail, Boye's image of this, uh, you know, dramatic moment of him watching uh, the devil rock out on his violin. <laughs> so let's get to Prokofiev. These are uh, some of Prokofiev's uh, chess pieces. They're uh, in the Prokofiev Museum in Moscow. Um, do you notice anything unusual about them? Anything that we're not used to seeing when we see a chess set? Rex? No crosses on the top of the kings. No crosses on top of the kings, why? Where are we? Russia. Soviet Russia, absolutely. In Soviet Russia, especially around this time, you're not gonna see any crosses on the kings. You're going to see uh, finials or something like that, or even uh, occasionally a hammer and sickle. You even see sometimes, but that's one thing that you will typically not see is a cross. So here's the poster for uh, the tournament 
that uh, Prokofiev and uh, David Oistrakh uh, played this, you know, fun exhibition that they put together. Prokofiev had been out of Russia for quite some time. He returns in 1936. And uh, he moves in next to Oistrak, and you've got these two guys who, uh, I, they were probably playing more chess than they were uh, making music at that time, but they developed a really, really close relationship. Um, the first uh, violin sonata was dedicated to Oistrak. It actually came after the second. The numbers are always publishing numbers, so they're usually not uh, sort of chronologically uh, related, but. What do you think about Prokofiev in terms of why he is considered to be, uh, you know, one of the most uh, important modern composers in, uh, in you know, Western civilization? Sure. Um, well, there's a lot that he plays with um, with our expectations, and a lot of sounds that we may not be used to hearing. A lot of the melodies that you hear in the piece that Hannah and I play tonight um, will be. Familiar, perhaps singable, hummable, but there's always a bit of a, a little bit of a jab there in terms of something unfamiliar, something we're not used to hearing, and a lot of that comes from actually a lot of the modernists were very fascinated with uh, the Renaissance, with medieval Europe, and they used a lot of the sounds that had sort of fallen out of fashion, and they incorporated that into their music. So, for instance, uh, there's this concept of modes in music, and we have a, a major mode and a minor mode. We refer to them as keys, a major key and a minor key nowadays. But they were arrangements of pitches, but there were also handfuls of other modes that they would play with that we weren't really allowed to use after a certain period of time because they weren't as pleasing to the ear. Um, so he, he plays around with this a lot. Um, but it's also Prokofiev's uh, personality, I think, that probably just couldn't resist playing with the sound a little bit. Um, you know, I was such a dork in college, and I, they published one of his diaries that I remember reading, and Prokofiev was just, um, you know, he was a very sardonic guy, you know, yeah. he was very sarcastic, very, um, you know, loved to prank people, loved to feel smarter than someone else, you know, and, and so there's that sense in the music of, of we're heading in this direction, and then he just sort of slaps you in the face of, you know, here's a surprise. So there's a lot of that in the music that you can look forward to. Do you think that anything about Prokofiev's composition style lends itself to someone who would have an interest in chess? Do you think there's any kind of direct connection? I always say there's a lot of relationships between music composition and, and chess. Um, there's a lot of composers I know, living composers, who are very interested in chess. Um, a lot of it has to do with, um, I, I, the way I phrase it is this idea of creativity within a structure. You know, there's only so many moves that you, that you can do, but there's endless possibilities of creativity, of strategy um, in the game of chess. And in music, it's the same way. You know, there's only so many pitches that we necessarily have available to us, but it's about arranging them in a new and interesting way. So you often find a lot of these composers are very interested in chess because of that sort of crossover there. I think there's also a, a sense of um, just upbringing and exposure. I mean, Prokofiev was uh, growing up in Russia, had a lot of exposure to chess because it was such a commonplace thing there. Um, he was in the chess club in uh, his, I think, from grade school. He was playing very young. And um, I used to laugh when I was reading his diary because he kept a record of um, the girls he liked at his school, and so he would he would finish his um, entries often with, you know, beat so and so at chess today, crossed Olga off the list, you know, something like that, where it was it was that, that sort of you know he really felt like you know this was my I'm I'm better than everyone I you know that sort of thing, and um, you can hear that in the music. There's that kind of snide mm. snide sound to it, but definitely music and chess. I mean, we're so intertwined for both Prokofiev and Oistrakh. And there's a lot of violinists in this show, too. We've got Oistrakh, uh, Louis Persinger, an American violinist, Misha Elman, uh, who's also Russian. Um, I feel like I'm missing somebody. But um, what I would like for Yasser to do now that we've looked at Oistrakh and Prokofiev, I would like for Yasser to, to take us through some of these chess matches uh, that Prokofiev and Oistrakh played and give us his insight. Well, let's do it. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an unexpected one at that to uh, be here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. Thank you all for coming. And I was asked if I would be so kind as to uh, go through a game that uh, was played between uh, these two players 
and, you know, give my uh, insights uh, about the game. Um, before I get started, let me just uh, give a little brief history about myself so you can understand that, well, maybe I'm an authority of the game of chess and <laughs> not in music. But uh, yeah, as Rex was mentioning, four-time U.S. champion. I played in the candidates tournaments uh, twice, and the eight players are going to become the challenger. Wano is going to become the challenger. So I was in the world's top ten for a number of years, and uh, I've always loved the international aspect of the game of chess. Uh, wherever I travel, uh, people have uh, recognized me, uh, recognized my games, and uh, commented about them. I'd like to tell you a story. The first time, it was 1979, I was 19 years old. I had, ra I had been raised in America, and uh, I remember hiding under my desk for the nuclear drills, because our evil enemy, the Soviet Union, you know, they're going to drop a bomb on us, and we have to be prepared. So going under your desk was the uh, modus operandi for survival. Great. So at 19, I go into the, the belly of the communist giant and go to Moscow, and I'm really, really stunned by my experience there because it seemed to me that the communists were pushing three things enormously on the society. And it was a shock for me. The first was poetry. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> the communists are all poets. Like, what? Where does that even come from? And uh, you ever get into, well, a drunken evening with Russians and I promise you, they will start, you know, uh, quoting poetry at you. It's like, what? The second thing was ballet. The Soviets loved their ballet. And they thought it was this great, great art. And they supported it enormously. And the third was chess. It was really just astonishing how good the general level of chess understanding was. And there's all of these jokes, and they're wonderful jokes about, you know, crossing the borders and passport officers recognizing chess players and saying to them, why did you take the knight on move six? Shouldn't you? <laughs> like, it would have been much better. <laughs> and so this was really uh, quite the shock. Now, for me, one of the things that was extraordinary about the Soviets was their technique, yeah? I mean, just in everything they did, uh, whether it be their poetry, whether it be their ballet, and whether it be chess. And all of those um, things allowed for creativity at the same time that they were strict about themselves, they were very creative. And this uh, game, what we're about to see is uh, a very romantic way of playing with great elan and artistry. We're talking attack, baby. <laughs> we're going to go for the king. And our protagonist, Sergei, he's white. And wouldn't you know it, he is playing the Leningrad variation of the Nimzo Indian, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. The Leningrad, well, we know what Leningrad is or was, but it doesn't exist today. Today, of course, it's St. Petersburg, but uh, we still call it the Leningrad variation. Now, what uh, is typified by White's play right now is this move queen to c2. And with this move queen to c2, a battery is being set up to attack this pawn on h7. So black responds by h7, h6. Now today, modern players will recognize the move that white plays, h2, h4, and say, Frank Marshall. 
the great American champion from the 1930s played this type of sacrifice. And we would say, hail America. Soviets didn't want to hear that. <laughs> they, they, they had their heroes. They didn't want to hear any Frank Marshall. But H2H4 is a kind of a siren call for an attack against blacks king, white sacrifices a bishop. And one of the things that um, makes for an incredibly exciting, dynamic battle is when the kings are on opposite flanks. In this case, black's king is on the king's side, white's king is on the queen's side, and it's sort of like, okay, go battle, because uh, you can go after the other side's king and sacrifice as much as you want. And away the two guys go. Bishop takes 94, and I just love this move, rook h5. So in my estimation, uh, Sergei was a candidate master. That's a really, really strong player. By American standards, that might be a life master or just slightly below international master. But it's incredible that somebody who is, let's say, an amateur would ever reach that level. This move, rook h5, is a prelude to a, a sacrifice. There goes one piece. Now, keep in mind, White had already sacrificed a bishop earlier. Now, after these moves, White is threatening, uh, pardon me, this move, rook check, White is threatening to go rook to H8 check and mate. So you can't accept that rook sacrifice. King G8, Queen E2, there goes the rook, sacrifices the rook. And now I'm going to call on a member of the audience to identify what Sergei did next. He sacrificed a bishop, he sacrificed a knight, he sacrificed a rook, and now he's going to sacrifice again and he's going to finish with a checkmate. Don't all identify at once. <laughs> <laughs> Here it comes. I w That's the second move. You need a preliminary move to queen h5. Well, come on, Rex. I mean, you can, I mean I'm not going to call on Shannon because, <laughs> I mean, she's the cure. And I'm not going to call on Joy, who just had a very nice one. <laughs> yes, sir. Bingo! Give that man a special prize. Absolutely. Rook h8. Check. And the idea here is, Rex, you wanted to play queen h5? You can do it with the tempo. And we finish with a checkmate. This is a really beautiful game. And I think for a lot of grandmasters, we would like to have this game in our best game collection. And I think it just goes to show him in his best light as this romantic, attacking player and, uh, well, uh, a, a very nice victory. And for me, a great pleasure to uh, say hello to you. And I hope you're going to enjoy this evening and the music that you're going to hear. Bradley, come back. Thank you, Yasser. <laughs> wow, that was incredible. I learned so much. Get in there, Bradley. Well, is that Yeah, I mean, I, we have an, a couple other pieces in the program if you were curious as to what they're doing there. Um, the, we're opening specifically with pieces that um, we were either young influences or inspirations of these two guys. So the Tartini is a piece that Oistrakh actually played on his graduation recital from the St. Petersburg Conservatory and then was a part of his repertoire for his touring that he did uh, globally. Um, so Hannah and I will be performing that piece first. Um, I'm following that with a solo piece, the Chopin Ballade Number no. 4. This piece um, is an 
incredible piece of music on its own, but we were delighted to hear that um, Prokofiev's mother uh, was a pianist and played a lot of Chopin for him as he was, as he was young. So this was definitely an, imp an influence on his compositional output because he was hearing this music, and so he was hearing this romantic, beautiful, but also daring music in its own way, and I think that had a lot of influence on on what he wrote. Those first two pieces and the final one are very um, intense and dramatic, so we thought we would give you a bit of a palate cleanser with the Rachmaninoff vocalese that we're going to perform. It's a very short piece, about four minutes long, very beautiful and slow and expressive. And then we finish with Prokofiev's own violin sonata number two. Um, I'm going to say this probably a couple times tonight because the principal flute of the St. Louis Symphony is coming to the concert tonight. But this was actually a flute sonata. Prokofiev wrote the piece for flute and piano. Um, Oysterach liked the piece so much that he insisted that Prokofiev make a version for violin and piano. And that's what you're going to hear tonight. Um, so when it says opus, opus means work that he published, 94A, that's the violin version that, that he wrote. And it's just full of this, like you pointed out in this chess game, it's very, it's romantic, it's robust, it's daring music, um, but it's also very pleasurable and something that I think everyone can enjoy. So a lot to look forward to. I have a lot of notes to play tonight, so I may have to go bail and uh, let you all, you know, uh, have a good time and enjoy a drink. And maybe if you guys uh, wanted to come up and ask these guys any questions about what, what they talked about this evening, you can. Otherwise, I'm going to duck out. And thank you very much. I'll see you soon. Good evening, everyone. I have my nice tall mic here. Isn't that nice? Welcome. I'm so happy you're all here. I'm so happy to welcome you to our concert, Prokofiev versus Oysterach. This is a very special presentation in conjunction with our Sound Moves exhibit we have going on downstairs. Do check it out. I'd be remiss if I did not thank Dr. Jeannie and Rex Singfeld for their generous support of the series. We're also grateful to the Regional Arts Commission and the Missouri Arts Council for their support. As I said, do check out our exhibits downstairs. We have that Sound Moves exhibit, and we also have our Game of Chess T.S. Eliot exhibit on our second floor. They're not sticking around forever, so do go check those out. WorldChessHof.org is where you can learn about all the things that we have going on here at the World Chess Hall of Fame, including our 2024 season of the music series, which has been announced online. Do check that out. Read about it. Learn about it. Experience it. So all kinds of good stuff you can look forward to in 2024, but I do want to get the concert started tonight. I'm very excited to introduce my collaborator for this evening. She is the assistant concert master for the St. Louis Symphony, and I think we've grown very close over the couple rehearsals that we spent working on this. And um, I'll invite her up, and then I'll explain a little bit about the program we're doing tonight. So please join me in welcoming Hannah G. So the first piece on the program, I'll let Hannah get set up over here. The first piece on the program is the Tartini Devil's Trill Sonata. So as we explained in the pre-concert chat, the composer dreamt that he met the devil, and the devil took his violin and uh, taught him the music that you are about to hear. So the piece is full of beautiful melodies, and as you can understand, lots of trills that Hannah has to perform, which are alternating notes on the instrument. She has lots to do in the next 10 minutes or so. So I encourage you to sit back, relax, and enjoy Tartini's Devil's Trail Sonata.
Hannah G, everyone. Hell of a piece, isn't it? No pun intended. Ha <laughs> um, Next on the program, this piece is all about the relationship between Sergei Prokofiev and David Oistrakh and their very famous chess match that took place. Um, the next piece on the program, I'll be performing solo for you, which is the Chopin Ballade number four. Um, uh, Prokofiev's mother growing up played a lot of Chopin in the household and he surely heard a lot of this music. Maybe not this piece, but a lot of Chopin and it certainly influenced his compositional style. So I hope you enjoy the fourth ballad of Frederick Chopin.
Thank you very much. I'm going to bring Hannah back now. We have two more pieces to play for you. The next is what we call a bit of a palate cleanser because uh, all the pieces on the program are pretty intense tonight. So please welcome back Hannah G. We're going to perform Rachmaninoff's vocalise.
For our final piece in the program, we're going to be performing the second violin sonata of Prokofiev's. Now, um, our principal flutist of the St. Louis Symphony is here. <laughs> And uh, I, I think he might bristle at the fact of us calling it a violin sonata because it is, in fact, a flute sonata. Look at him looking at me. Hi, Matthew. Um, it is, in fact, a flute sonata that um, Oistrakh liked so much that he insisted that Prokofiev turn into a violin sonata. So what you're hearing tonight is one of the closest collaborations that they had in terms of music creation. So it's in four movements, and it's... Um, got all kinds of twists, turns, surprises, lots of fun to have, and lots of beautiful music. So I hope you all enjoy Prokofiev's second flute slash violin sonata. Thank you. 
Thank you.